Hello, my name is Cheryl Yankee. I'm the manager of microbiology here at St. Joe's. Today I'd like to talk to you about blood culture and microbiology collection. Here at St. Joe's, we use the BACTEC system for blood culture collection. Typically in an adult, we draw two sets of blood cultures. A set consists of an aerobic, which is a blue bottle, and an anaerobic, which is a purple bottle. We always draw the blue bottle first, and we'll talk about the reason for that a little bit later. For pediatric patients, we usually draw a single blood culture set. That set consists of a pink bottle, which is an aerobic bottle. When you're drawing blood cultures, always check the expiration dates on the bottle. Do not use the bottles if they are expired. The BACTEC system detects bacterial growth by detecting carbon dioxide that is produced when the organisms metabolize the culture media. The CO2 actually reacts with a fluorescent dye, which is in a disc in the bottom of the bottle. And that CO2 causes a red fluorescence in that disc. The instrument scans the BACTEC bottles every 10 minutes for red fluorescence. When it detects a cer certain level, it gives us a visual and an audible cue. We then pull the bottle, do a gram stain, subculture to agar plates, and also set up a molecular test called a biofire, which identifies 33 of the common agents of sepsis. It also detects some of the common antibiotic resistance mechanisms. The manufacturer of our blood culture system, Becton Dickinson, worked with many hospitals um, trying to find a way to reduce blood culture contamination. And they found that if the patient's arm was pre-cleaned with either a baby wipe or soap and water prior to performing the skin antisepsis, they could dramatically decrease the contamination rates. So we have incorporated that step into our procedure here at St. Joe's. In the next slide, you will see a video on peripheral blood culture collection. Again, prior to starting that procedure, we ask that you clean the patient's arm with a baby wipe or soap and water. See a demonstration of best practices for blood culture collection. Anyone involved in this task should know how critical it is. Adhering to protocol reduces the chance of lab errors and promotes accurate results. By following the correct procedure, you can protect your patient as well as yourself. This demonstration shows you how to perform venipuncture, which is the recommended technique for blood collection. Arterial and catheter blood collection methods are occasionally necessary, but generally not recommended. So let's get started. The first step is to check the clinician's orders to ensure you have the correct culture media and blood collection tubes. Then gather all the supplies you'll need for the collection procedure, including gloves, tourniquet, skin disinfectant, safe blood collection and transfer devices, appropriate sets of blood culture vials, and sample identification labels. Please note, labels should never be applied to the collection vials until after blood collection is completed. Then visually inspect the vials to make sure there are no cracks or signs of contamination, such as excessive cloudiness. Check the expiration date as well. Finally, be sure the sharps collector is within easy reach. Greet the patient and introduce yourself in a friendly and professional way. Verify that the patient's ID matches the information on the request sheet. Ask the patient to spell his or her surname and confirm the date of birth. If the patient is unable to speak, verify his or her identity according to your institutional protocol. Needless to say, patient misidentification can have tragic consequences. Then, wash your hands thoroughly and don gloves. The optimal amount of blood to collect and the acceptable fill range are clearly printed on the BD BACTEC vials. It's a good idea to mark the optimal fill volume on each vial to make sure you fill them correctly. Remove the cap from each vial and disinfect the septum with a 70% alcohol swab. Allow to air dry. Apply the tourniquet and select the venipuncture site or vein. Release the tourniquet. Carefully disinfecting the site is a critical step because even a single surviving microorganism can potentially contaminate the blood culture, so it's important to be thorough. For best results, 
It's recommended that you use a chlorhexidine gluconate solution, such as the chloroprep FREP. Gently press the applicator against the treatment site until it is noticeably visible on the skin. Once solution is visible on the skin, use gentle back and forth strokes to prep the site. Make sure to follow the manufacturer's instructions for site preparation and antiseptic requirements. Once the site is disinfected, make sure to allow the area to air dry completely before continuing. This is critical to ensure complete decontamination of the skin. Do not touch the site again. If additional palpitation is necessary, you will have to completely disinfect the site once again. The safest way to collect blood is using a closed evacuated system, such as a winged blood collection set. Preferably one that enables the clinician to activate the safety mechanism with one hand while the needle is still inside the patient's vein, such as the BD Vacutainer push button blood collection set. When using sets of vials, it's important to collect the aerobic vial first, then the anaerobic vial. Apply the tourniquet. Insert the needle in the vein and look for the presence of blood in the chamber. Inoculate the aerobic vial by pressing the blood collection device down onto the vial neck so that the inner needle pierces the septum. A vacuum in the vial can cause it to exceed the optimal fill volume, so you should monitor the volume of blood as it's being collected. To monitor accurately, the vial must be kept upright. When the maximum fill mark is reached, remove the vial from the blood collection device and gently mix the contents. Then, repeat the procedure with the anaerobic vial. Once the vials have been filled, you can continue to use the same blood collection device to inoculate any additional tubes. Handle the tubes according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Release and remove the tourniquet if this was not done during the collection process. If the safety device you're using is a push button system, depress the button to retract the needle while it is still in the vein. If the device you're using has a sliding needle protection shield, withdraw the needle and push the safety shield forward until it's locked in place. When the needle has been removed, place and hold a sterile gauze over the puncture site. Bandage the arm. Dispose of all contaminated sharps in an appropriate disposal container and other contaminated material in appropriate disposal containers. It's a best practice to decontaminate the septum of each vial after inoculation using an alcohol swab. Clean up any spillage from the outsides of the vials as well. Remove gloves appropriately and wash your hands. Children and other patients with fragile veins may require the use of a needle and syringe for blood collection. In these instances, the recommended safe procedure is to use a needle with a safety shield. When the correct volume of blood is collected, the needle should be disposed of. A BD Vacutainer blood transfer device is then attached to the syringe to transfer the blood safely, avoiding the risk of a needle stick or contamination. As with the closed collection system, the aerobic vial should be inoculated first when using the BD Vacutainer blood transfer device and syringe. It's especially important to inoculate the aerobic vial first, as an air bubble may sit in the top of the syringe. Monitor the volume collected and stop inoculation when the maximum fill mark is reached. Then, repeat the procedure with the anaerobic vial. As noted earlier, vials should always be labeled immediately after blood collection. As with all specimens sent to the lab, Labels should include the patient's name and any required identification information. The date and time of the blood collection must always be noted on the labels. Follow your institution's specific patient identification guidelines and requisition criteria. It is critically important to label everything clearly and avoid mistakes, such as writing on a label or sticking an additional label over the original or on the bottom of the vial. Any confusion or uncertainty about blood samples in the lab can compromise a patient's treatment and health. Inoculated vials must be carefully packaged for safe transport to the laboratory. They should be shipped as soon as possible and preferably at room temperature. Blood culture vials must always be shipped in a container that will prevent them from dropping or knocking against each other to minimize the risk of damage. Be sure to securely package blood culture vials when samples are sent through a pneumatic tube system. When blood cultures need to be transported from satellite locations to the microbiology lab or over greater distances, shipping containers need to be compliant with UN 3373 requirements. This means the container must have a sturdy outer package, primary and secondary watertight inner receptacles, 
and enough absorbent material between the primary and secondary receptacles to absorb the entire volume of liquid in the event the packaging fails. Best practices dictate that regardless of how they're transported, blood culture should be entered into blood culture instruments as soon as possible to shorten the time to detection, allowing earlier identification and susceptibility testing. Furthermore, delays in loading blood culture vials into the lab's analytic system can interfere with growth detection. Some delays may be unavoidable. In those instances, please follow the manufacturer's recommendations and the lab guidelines. Keep in mind, however, that the sooner a patient is treated with the right antibiotic, the better the clinical outcome. Blood collection and culturing is a critical component of healthcare and medical practice. By always following these best practices, you will be safeguarding your institution and helping your patients get the best treatment as quickly as possible. The video you just saw described the back container method for blood culture collection, which is sometimes called the direct draw method. It is the preferred method for blood culture collection and the one recommended by Becton Dickinson. As you saw in that technique, you attach a butterfly to the vacutainer holder, you clean the bottle tops, you mark your fill level on the bottles, perform your skin antisepsis, perform the, the, ve the venipuncture, and again, start the fill. Again, probably one of the most important steps in this procedure is monitor, monitoring that fill level using the graduations on the bottle. Once your bottle is, is filled, put pressure on the arm, discard your uh, butterfly and vacuum container holder as the sharps. Again, very important in this is marking your bottles for proper fill. Never draw your bottles without using a butterfly. The neck of the bottle will fit directly into a vacuum container holder, but that's not an appropriate way to draw the blood culture because you can't monitor the fill level. And also there is some potential for reflux of the media into the patient's vein, and that could cause a phlebitis. As they discussed in the video, an alternate method for collection of blood cultures is with a syringe. In this technique, you should attach your butterfly to a 20 mil syringe for an adult. Again, you would clean your bottle tops with 70% alcohol, perform your skin antisepsis, perform the venipuncture. But once you have drawn the blood um, into the syringe, you will actually fill the bottles using a blood transfer device. We ask that you use this because it is um, a safety device. Prior to development of this transfer device, we saw a large number of needle stick incidents when blood culture bottles were filled, mostly because that rubber septum in that bottle is extremely thick and hard to inject through. Um, again, when you're done with a syringe draw, you put pressure on the site and bandage it. With the syringe, here at St. Joe's, we use chloroprep for skin antisepsis. Chloroprep is actually um, chlorhexidine gluconate in alcohol, and it's considered the best antiseptic for blood culture collection currently. When using chloroprep, you actually do a back and forth friction scrub to clean the blood culture site. Um, you want to scrub for a full 30 seconds and then let it air dry. Because chloroprep can cause irritation and other side effects in infants less than two months of age, we actually have a protocol for using iodine and alcohol in those babies less than two months old. When you're performing your blood cultures, again, it's important that you wipe the bottle tops with 70% alcohol. The cap on those septum protects the septum, keeps it somewhat clean, but you need to wipe it off with alcohol to prevent contamination. And Becton Dickinson does recommend you use one alcohol pad per bottle, and again, let those bottle tops dry before you do your fill. Both the Joint Commission 
and the College of American Pathologists require that we monitor blood culture contamination rates. These are reported by unit, not by individual collector, and the current recommended goal is to have less than 3% contamination. You might say, what is a contaminated blood culture? Well, it's one that usually has skin flora. So this could be coagulase negative staph, micrococcus, a group of gram positive rods we call diphtheroids. It also could be a contaminant from the environment, and that might be a bacillus species or the gram negative ACE nidobacter. And the reason that we monitor contamination rates is because it has several negative effects. First of all, when blood cultures are contaminated, it usually causes additional trauma for the patients. Um, if the physician is uncertain of the significance, they usually reorder blood cultures, the patient gets another two sticks. It also increases length of stay. When blood cultures are recollected again, the patient usually has to stay an extra 24 to 48 hours to make sure those blood cultures are truly negative. Again, if the physician is unsure of the significance, they may start the patient on vancomycin or other antibiotics. Um, so that's a trend that tends to lead to the MDROs, the multi-drug resistant or organisms that we see. This often also results in ordering of other lab tests. And again, the longer a patient stays in the hospital, the higher risk there is for complications like urinary tract infections or infections of an IV site. So overall, it's best to um, prevent contamination, and that's why we monitor it. Blood culture volume is the most important factor for recovery of blood cultures from septic patients. Generally, you need between 30 and 40 mils of blood to accurately diagnose sepsis. When drawing blood cultures, again, we prefer the direct draw or vacutainer method. You need to carefully monitor your filled level using the graduations on the side of the labels. We actually only draw catheter central line blood cultures with physician order. We prefer peripheral blood cultures over central line blood cultures, mostly because the central line blood cultures are more likely to be contaminated. Fortunately, the manufacturer of Becton Dickinson's made it easy for us. They have the blood culture volume draws right on the front of the bottles. Um, in smaller letters, there is an acceptable volume. And in bigger red letters, there's an optimal volume. The acceptable volume will allow us to detect sepsis in most cases, but the optimal volume gives us the best ratio of blood and broth to broth and gives us the best chance for recovery of organisms. So in the aerobic and anaerobic back tech bottles, three to 10 mils is acceptable. 8 to 10 mils of blood is the optimal volume to add to those bottles. In the pediatric bottle, the pink bottle, the optimal and the acceptable volume are the same, 0 0.5 to 5 mils. Um, again, if you're someone working in NICU, it may be difficult to attain 0 0.5 mils on a very small neonatal infant, so microbiology will accept anything that looks blood tinged on an NICU baby. If you're drawing with a syringe, um, you're going to use the, the barrel of the syringe to monitor your fill. If you get less than three mils, we ask that you redraw the blood culture. Um, when you have less than three mils of blood, you've got probably about a 20% chance of recovery in an adult. Um, it, it's not an optimal situation. We do, however, have written into our protocol um, an exception. If there's less than three mils and you know you absolutely can the blood culture, we ask that you put all of that blood in a pink pediatric bottle. Again, the reason we have you do that is because something is better than nothing, but again, it gives us a very minimal chance for recovery of the organism causing sepsis. 
So um, we ask that that basically be a last resort. If you get three to nine mils, we actually have you put the entire amount of blood into the aerobic bottle. And the reason for that is because more organisms that cause sepsis are aerobic and more organisms grow in that aerobic bottle. So if the blood flow stops and you can only get one bottle, the aerobic bottle gives us the best chance for recovery. If you get between 10 and 20 mils, we have you split that volume equally between the aerobic and anaerobic bottles. The number and timing of blood cultures is also important in recovery of organisms causing sepsis. You want to draw blood cultures before antibiotics are given whenever possible. There are resins in both the aerobic and the pediatric bottle which help neutralize antibiotics, but they're not perfect. It's always better to draw the blood cultures before the antibiotics are administered to the patient. We used to draw blood cultures 15 to 30 minutes apart. We now know that that does not improve recovery. Um, again, you want to draw them before antibiotics and as close to the fever cycle as possible, but you can draw set one and set two sequentially. That is, you'll basically draw the two blood cultures back to back and we'll be completing both sets in about 10 minutes. The exception to this is for subacute bacterial endocarditis. In endocarditis, you actually have a colony or vegetation on the patient's heart valve. And that vegetation is continuously seeding the patient's blood with either coagulative staph or viridin strep. And so we want to distinguish skin contamination from the organism always being present in the patient's blood. So typically, for SBE, we draw three blood cultures and they're spaced 30 to 60 minutes apart. So if the patient truly has subacute bacterial endocarditis, multiple blood cultures will be positive with that cognitive staph or uh, strep viridin's group. Typically, again, in adults, we draw two sets of blood cultures. In pediatric patients, most of the time we draw only a single set and the reason for that is because when a pediatric patient goes sepsis, they have a much higher concentration of organisms in their blood. Adult patients usually have between zero and 100 organisms per mil. Most pediatric patients have between 1,000 and 10,000 organisms per mil. So you have a much better chance of recovering your septic or your organism causing sepsis in pediatric patients, even with a single set. If a physician does order two blood cultures on a pediatric patient, it is acceptable to draw both sets. Order of draw for blood cultures and actually all lab collections is very important. For blood cultures, we want to always draw those first. And that's because for a blood culture, we're going to do the skin antisepsis, and we want to collect the blood culture while the patient's arm is the cleanest. So if you do have blood cultures and then some additional chemistries or hematologies ordered, do the blood cultures first, then collect your, your other tests, your other tubes. Again, you always want to draw your aerobic bottle first. And blood cultures should always be drawn by peripheral vein of puncture, again, unless the line draw is specifically ordered. We did start a policy about five or six years ago that's been very successful. It's helped us reduce our central line associated bloodstream infections. And that policy is if the patient has a central line, the blood cultures are all drawn by the vascular access team or what we call the VAT team. So if the patient has a central line, your job is to call the VAT team and tell them blood cultures are required. They will then draw the appropriate blood cultures. A blood culture, as for any laboratory specimen, has to be properly labeled. We have to have patient name and 
date of birth as the minimum for a, an identifier. Again, generally when a blood culture is ordered, the lab label will have all the patient demographics, so you will just need to check it against the patient's arm band. In addition to the patient identifiers, the blood culture has to be labeled with the collect date and time and the collector initials. And we ask for your initials in case we need to follow up unusual results with a blood culture. We may need to know how it was collected or when it was collected. Also important, when you label the blood culture, affix the label lengthwise on the bottle, don't wrap it around and make sure you don't cover the bottle barcode, the barcode used by the instrument to identify the bottle and monitor the readings. To summarize some blood culture dues, always use hand hygiene and wear gloves when you collect the blood culture. Do a scrub for 30 seconds with your CHG antiseptic. Allow that CHG, that chloroprep to dry thoroughly before proceeding with the venipuncture. Clean your bottle tops with 70% alcohol. Use one alcohol pad per bottle. Always dry your aerobic bottle first. And again, in an adult, we're going to draw two sets of blood cultures from two separate vein of punctures. Never draw four bottles from one, one vein of puncture. And the reason for that is if that uh, site is contaminated, multiple bottles may be contaminated with skin flora. Some blood culture don'ts. Don't touch the collection site after it's been cleaned with your antiseptic. If you have to relocate a vein, wear a sterile glove, or if you relocate the vein with a non-sterile glove or your finger, reclean the site. Don't ever wipe or fan or blow on the prepared site. That can cause contamination of blood culture. And again, don't routinely collect from a line. Peripheral draws are indicated unless the line draws specifically ordered by the doctor. Um, and again, the doctor may order um, one set as a line draw, one set as a peripheral draw to try and rule out central line associated bloodstream infections or what we call CLABSIs. That's an older technique that's not very commonly used now. We now know that two peripheral blood cultures are actually better. Don't collect your blood cultures at the time of IV start. Again, you think you might be saving the patient a stick, but because of the higher contamination rate, um, those blood cultures often have to be recollected and we haven't gained anything. Um, don't cover the barcode on the bottles. Again, the barcode is required by the instrument to identify the bottles. A positive blood culture is a critical value. When we get a positive in the laboratory, we will call you with the results and both Joint Commission and College of American Pathologists require that you do a full readback of the blood culture results and require that we document your name and title. So when we call, we will give you the gram stain result. We will give you an organism identification. If we could identify an organism by that rapid molecular test called the biofire, and we will also let you know if we detected any resistance markers with that biofire. You will need to do a full readback of that result to us. Um, if you fail to give us your name, we will call you back because we do have to have that information documented. And finally for today, I'd like to show you this chart. This chart should be available on your unit, either posted in the med room or near your supply cart. We have to protect them once they're outside of the body and that's the purpose of most of these um, collection and transport containers. When you're using this chart, if you see a refrigerator next to the container, that means keep the specimen cold after it's collected. All of these transport containers can be stored at room temperature prior to addition of the samples. Um, 
and when it has that refrigerator sign, um, keep it cold in the refrigerator until it's sent, send it on an ice with an ice pack or send it on ice. Also want you to know that um, the microbiology department is uh, read readily available if you have any questions or concerns. Um, I have a very experienced group down in microbiology and we're happy to answer any questions you have on collection or orders. Um, so please don't has hesitate to call. So I want to thank you for your attention today and uh, welcome you to St. Joe's. Thank you.